<laughs> uh, Brad Thor, author of Full Black, which if you haven't met, that, when did that when did that come out? A year ago? This, it came out last summer. Okay, a great book. I think it's one of the best you've Thank done. You. I was going to say the best, and then I remember the last Thomas Patriot. Jefferson, yeah, yeah the Last Patriot. Um, uh, Barrett Moore is here, a, a life continuity expert, and he is uh, uh, telling us about this wheel and now the the specific things that we have to do, what is under surveillance and how do you prepare? What is databases never forget and two is one and one is none? Well, I think we could give you some anecdotal evidence as it is as to what is happening in each one of these segments. Now, before people barrage you on emails, uh, we don't have enough blackboard space to begin going through all the categories. Uh, for example, in the surveillance world, there are about 18 areas that we spend a lot of time worrying about. They'd be sectors of our lives where information is being collected. So we have seven here. And in a preparation space, there are about 30 categories you need to be worried about, and we're going to cover seven, kind of bread and butter issues. So I know there's some other... We, can I ask a stupid question? This is something I shouldn't ask on television, but uh -huh. aren't we doing some? Aren't you guys preparing something? Aren't we doing something that we're going to be working on and, and, and showing yep. people? Uh, we, we actually have been uh, discussing yeah. how do we take this information, because we've only got two hours, and it's, it's already going fast in this show, and there is so much... Uh, that yeah, we are working on a project. I guess we're announcing our project, so to speak, That's, here you know a little what? bit. I always play dumb because when I th <laughs> then they're like, oh crap! Well, now yeah. we're doing it. And I'm like, no. yes, but oh darn. We are working on a project together with Mercury to to bring this information, to bring it out to the general public, to be yeah. the authoritative source for life continuity. Because this is the number one question of how how do we prepare, yeah. and uh, and you guys are the best at it. All right. Well, there, there's a mind-boggling array of information out there, and a lot of it's awful good. Um, you know, put it through the lens that when you look through life and make a decision whether you think it makes sense. But we're going to establish a foundation here today, open your eyes as it might be, and you'll watch GBTV in the future, and I'm sure you're going to have other opportunities to kind of get that 201, 301, and 401 classes. Hopefully, Glenn will bring those to you. So let's talk a little bit about the surveillance area where we have some vulnerability. So we'll kind of talk about the bad, and then we're going to talk about the good, the good being how you can, as it is, live on the edge of the herd. That's another one of my mantras, which is have the courage within your community, your family, your friends, your corporations to live on the edge of the herd. What's that mean? You don't have to be like everyone else. Just because no one else is prepared doesn't mean that you don't have to be unprepared. The single greatest mistake I see with clients is they think they believe in checkbook capitalism, which is I've got a checkbook, I've got some financial resources, what else do I need to do? It couldn't be further from the truth. Okay? That checkbook in the time of need, in the time of things Over. that could go bad, and they come in a variety of flavors, that checkbook arguably isn't going to do anything for you. So listen carefully. So let's just talk about the financial world, which is, in fact, let's skip to communi communications because it's easier, which is um, if I have your phone records, uh, I have your home phone record, I have your business phone records, and I have your cell phone records. Uh, I own you, okay? I know everyone you know, okay? I know everyone you communicate with. I can look at the patterns. I can determine where you live. I can find your family. And that is information that's readily available. Again, it's supposed to be private, but it is readily available, and that's just due to technology as it might be. Interesting enough, the NSA, the National Security Agency, is, of course, the biggest transgressor. There has been, you may have found, followed this over the last four or five years, the NSA has basically been spying on Americans, even though it's a, against the law, and they've been doing that for well over a decade. And Bill Clinton announced this. What was the name of that server, that, that uh, computer front? What is it? Echelon. Echelon. Well, it's gone well beyond Echelon. Yeah, Echelon, that's what I Echelon was a system that, in essence, took signals out of the air and examined them. What's happened is they have a separate program, and it goes by a variety of names. But what it's done is they've actually gone in on the Internet backbones, and they developed a technology. It's called a digital splitter. And what it ensured is that every communication that came across that trunk line, as it was, was duplicated. One went off to their server farm, and the other one went off and was delivered to its intended recipient. They literally are choking on data. Now, interesting enough, for, uh, excuse me, at Camp Williams in Utah, the NSA is in the late stages of completing a brand new one million square foot data center because they, of course, ran out of room at Fort Meade. Well, Fort Meade really ran out of room because the government, great guys, look, they're, they're on our side by and large, okay? Don't ever misconstrue that I'm against the government, I'm against our, against our intelligence services. But sometimes they get a little remunctions and they forget that we have civil liberties. But the reality of that is the impediment at Fort Meade in expanding it was 
they were sucking too much electricity out of the grid and they couldn't pull any more out of it without building a whole series of new nuclear power plants, which of course get the environmentalists involved. And so, if I can jump in here a second, yeah. Glenn, something that's fascinating is there was a paper uh, done at the Brookings Institute about how it is getting less and less expensive to store more and more data. And we have this interesting paradigm that's happening now where it is actually nudging dictators further into being dictators and free relatively free governments are now saying well wait a second I can store uh, one of the one of the interesting pieces of intel or information I came up with that if you wanted to store all the telephone conversations in the United States now it basically cost you 17 cents a year per person by 2015 that'll be two cents a year uh, per person and uh, there was a great formula done Good thing we're gonna be broke well, yeah, <laughs> we're going to be broke, but we what's interesting, broke. we are broke. What's interesting, though, is that if the government wants to do this stuff, what people see coming is a public safety tax so that citizens will actually have to pay for being observed and being under surveillance all the time. So it's just, it's an interesting thing to see as the technology improves, it actually encourages governments. I had a, I, I had a, a guy call me. Um, he was, um, you know, a decent figure in Google and he told me we're in um, we're digging trenches around our server farms he said we have pretty good we have pretty good trenches he said but we're digging these things I think he said 10 feet deep and I said oh, okay and he said you might want to look into the relationship between Google and the government we seem to be in business with the government I don't know what they're doing but it's pretty darn interesting that uh, the government is looking even for more space uh, for servers. They're building it also a huge one in Virginia. And they can dig ditches outside Google, but they can't do it at the border. Yeah. Uh, that's another. Yeah. Well, well, Glenn, actually, that you're touching arguably on the social media space. And uh, notwithstanding, there have been some phenomenal developments there, whether we're talking about Twitter, Facebook, uh, MySpace, whatever it might be. Uh, if you dig deep enough, you can actually find some of the organizations that funded those entities. Well, no, come on, don't, uh, come on. Hang it out there. Oh, well, the Central Intelligence Agency has a, uh, has a venture capital firm. They've had it for 15, uh, 15 years. Uh, they've had it about 10 years. And they fund nascent early technologies, and if it happens to have a nexus that uh, complements their mission, so be it. So the social media space has been the absolute greatest boon to the people that want to monitor us. This is why the Library of Congress is now saving every tweet, every Facebook, everything. And what is today? Today's the one year anniversary of the uprising in Egypt, which was largely credited to uh, Twitter and YouTube. So it's, it's interesting that we should be here tonight. Okay. We, we could do a whole program on the social media and, and the we negative will. ramifications of okay. it. It's, it's, it's particularly scary. All right, so let's go to a little bit of preparation here. Or does it, wait, does anybody have any questions on anything yet? You guys are just like... None. None, okay. Yeah. All right, okay. here we go. Um, preparation. There are about 30 categories where we need to be prepared, uh, and, and they run the gamut. Preparation really falls into two worlds. One, for immediate need. You've got now a, n a nice, wonderful 72-hour pack. Are you going to protect a, a defined group of people for a defined period of time? Or are we worried about as it might be the collapse of society and we're worried about what we call sustainability those are really kind of two different worlds today we're talking about preparation we're talking about your uh, your your interruption of the supply chain due to a natural disaster or it could be a financial disaster as it might be one only really has to look at any individual uh, whether it, it, it's the tuna fish we eat or whether it's the peanut butter that goes on our sandwiches or it's the the aspirin that's on the store shelves the the United States has been the leader and the technology that underpins an incredibly efficient supply chain. It is it has lowered our cost. It's absolutely brilliant. But unfortunately, there's good with bad. In, inadvertently, as corporations have become more and more and more and more efficient in terms of delivering goods, and it, we, we've come to suffer from what I call the 7-Eleven effect. And what the 7-Eleven effect is, we are two generations deep of people in this nation who have only ever known 7-Eleven to be open 24 hours a day and the store shelves be full. So why in the world would I have to have a pantry? I can go down to 7-Eleven. I can, I, you know, the stores are always open. Well, if you understood how often they got resupplied, all one has to do is look at the videos that take place post a or pre a hurricane and post a hurricane, and you see those big empty shelves. Anybody tell me how many times are the short, uh, are the stores, the grocery stores, re, um, resupplied? Weekly. Weekly. Every night. Every night. 
Uh, it depends on where the grocery store, whether it's suburban or it's rural, but the average grocery store gets 14 deliveries a day. Under normal uses, the store shelves are empty within three days. If there's a run on something, it's ours. But that's on average. Now, the, the chain stores are slightly different, but the stuff you care about, it's hard to come by. Now, this is expensive stuff. I mean, the reality about pre preparation, and we all have to live under budgets, is you're asking yourself to advance expenses theoretically into the future. So what that means is if you wanted to protect yourself and have the necessities on hand to protect your family, as it might be, for one month, then you have to look at what it costs to operate your family for a period of one month and anticipate all, all those needs in a variety of categories. So if we look at now life's necessities, they actually start with air. It's a little more complicated subject than we want to go in today. But we've got, obviously, water. You can't go much more than about three days without water. Food, shelter, there's clothing in there. A plan is important. Fuel and power are important. Medical is important. Mindset is important. But the list goes on. There's a myriad of things. Transportation, communication, spare parts. Uh, it, it goes on and on and on. What I encourage everyone to do is develop a mindset and a plan, and you begin to budget this. Most people can't go out and just spend $10,000 overnight on something like this. So start spending $500 a month, as it might be. Hopefully nothing happens in the meantime, and before you know it, at the end of the year, you've got a sizable little cache of stuff, as it might be. And you become more sophisticated. And I think hopefully in the future, Glenn will do some programs where we can literally get into the building blocks as to what you do on day one and what you want to do on day two, and then you go from there.